This is going to be James chapter 5, and we are going to look at the rich and the tribulation and some other things. If you have watched the past lessons on James, you can see that all rich people in the tribulation are wicked lost people because they are the ones who have taken the mark of the beast. One of the things that shows us that James is a tribulation epistle is that it has all the rich people being lost. While in the church age, a man can be rich and still be saved. In the tribulation, if a man takes the mark of the beast, he will be damned for eternity. Men will take the mark in the tribulation so that they can buy and sell. But first we will, we will look at the misery of the rich man. In James chapter 5 and verse 1 it says, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. The rich man in the time of Jacob's trouble is going to face a lot of misery. They are going to see the devilish locusts that come up out of the bottomless pit that torment men for five months. In Revelation 9, these people who are tormented will desire to die but will not be able to commit suicide. These rich men are going to face the plagues of God's two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. They will face earthquakes, pestilences, famine, war, and if they survive all this, they will hide it in dens and in the rocks from the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, as it says in Revelation 6.15, Every bondman, every free man, and the rich men and mighty men hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. They think they are something because they are rich, but they are actually poor because they are alone without God. Imagine going through the tribulation without a God to call on. Revelation 3 and 17 says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. So in the time of Jacob's trouble, the rich will see misery, just like Jesus Christ said in Matthew 16, 26, For what is a man profited, if he shall gain the whole world, and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Some people would rather have money and power than to serve God and be poor or just be average. TV preachers pretend that you will get all kinds of money if you serve God and give to their ministry, but this is a lie. Jesus Christ wasn't rich and even said he didn't have a place to lay his head. The birds and foxes had a better place to live than Jesus Christ did. As a Christian, you should want to serve God no matter what and choose Jesus Christ over the pleasures of sin that only last for a season. But next we will see how the possessions of the rich will see ruin. In James 5 and verse 2 it says, Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. It's like Jesus said in Matthew 6.20, But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where th thieves do not break through nor steal. The possessions of the rich during this time period aren't going to last long because look at all the disasters that happened during the tribulation time period. Can you imagine how many thieves there will be during that coming time period? It will be like the Purge movies, but in real life, even the rich men now have worries and they have more worries than a poor man has. The rich man will stay up all night worrying about who is taking his money. And Proverbs says a lot about the rich man. It says in Proverbs 23, 5, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Proverbs eleven four: Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness, righteousness delivereth from death. Proverbs 11.28 He that trusteth in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. Proverbs 13.7 There is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. Did you know that these rich men who take the mark of the beast will not have their name written in the book of life? So they are choosing riches over their name being put in the book of life. And Proverbs 22, 1 says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. 
they are forfeiting a good name that would be in the book of life for just temporary riches. As Proverbs 27, 24 says, for riches are not forever. And James 5, 3 says, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rest of them shall be a witness against you, and ye shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Notice it said, the rust of them shall be a witness against you. Remember Jesus said, Rust doth corrupt the treasures on this earth. Then James 5, 3 says, Ye have heaped treasures together for the last days. Further proof, this is referring to the time of Jacob's trouble, where rich men will have set up treasures down here, when they should have got on the Lord's side and set their affection on things above. And as Christians in the church age, we sometimes put too much worry and care into things of this world. Maybe we even get mad at our kids or family for tearing something up in the house. And maybe your kid wrecked your car and you went off on them for it. Or maybe you lost your job and got discouraged and got mad at God. All these things happen when you put too much emphasis on the things of this world. We should also be setting our affection on things above. Things that are above are things like New Jerusalem, Jesus Christ, the words of God, which are settled forever in heaven, and so on. When you take your eyes off Jesus Christ and get them on the world, then the world can easily disappoint you. And now we look at verse 4 and see how the rich get rich by fraud. James 5.4 says, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Proverbs 22.16 says, He that oppresseth the poor to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. So these rich men will oppress the poor, and they get their riches by fraud, but they won't go unpunished. Notice it says, The cries of them have entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. The Lord of Sabaoth is the Lord of hosts. The host is an army. And Exodus 15.3 calls God a man of war. And you better not forget that when Jesus comes back the second time, they won't crucify him again. In Revelation 11-16, through 16, it says, And I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And this is when you will see these rich men hiding in their luxurious underground bunkers. They won't go unpunished, just like it says in Romans, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Even for us now, there's no sense in trying to get revenge on someone who is doing you wrong or trying to get back at your boss or whoever. Turn it over to God and he will take care of it. No bad deed goes unnoticed. And all things will be known. They'll be made known at the great white throne judgment. And next we will see the rich in the tribulation will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. It says... And James 5, 5, ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. This is already true now. People are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. For example, an average man could name the top players in the NBA, the MLB, and the NFL, and the NHL, and golf. But he couldn't name the books of the Bible. And by these rich men loving pleasure... They will end up poor and in hell. In Proverbs 21, 17, it says, He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. They would rather please their self than to please God. They are lovers of their own self, just like many Christians in the church age are. 
and most lost people on this earth in the days we are in now are seeking pleasure 24 hours a day, and this is a sign of the last days of the church age. As it says in Second Timothy 3, 1 through 4, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, and thankful and holy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. We need to realize we were made for God's pleasure and not for our own pleasure. Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. James 5.5 5 says, You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. These same rich men will kill God's people during the time of Jacob's trouble. James 5.6 says, You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. These rich men will slaughter God's people during the tribulation at an altar. It will be a part of the worship service. You can already see people getting accustomed to seeing killing by watching movies like The Purge, where people kill just to be killing. They will kill like an animal kills another animal, without any mercy and no conscience. And Revelation 6, 9 says that when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony of which they held. And Re Revelation 20 and verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they set upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. God's people will be slaughtered like sheep by the rich men during the time of Jacob's trouble. As it says in Psalms 44:22, Yea, for thy sake are we killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Notice how James 5, 5 and verse 5 says, He doth not resist. God's people will let them kill them because they know this life isn't all there is. As it says in Revelation 12:11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved their lives. And they love not their lives unto the death. We also need to realize this life isn't all there is. We get so caught up in work and family and fun that we forget that God is looking for us to fellowship with Him by reading our Bible, praying, and looking for Him to come and get us in a pre-tribulation rapture. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. If we are having a desire to depart and be with Christ which is far better, then that will show in our life. No one wants to die, but Christians shouldn't dread dying. Psalms 116.15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And James 5.7 says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. You can read more about this rain in Joel 2 and 23, which says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. After a three and a half year drought in the tribulation, Elijah, who is one of the two witnesses in Revelation 11, causes the rain to come down. As it says in Revelation 11.6, He has power to shut heaven. And then after this rain, Jesus Christ shows up in Hosea 6 and verse 3. It says, Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. Notice James 5.7 says, The precious fruit of the earth. Look at James 5, 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. 
And then if you look at Revelation 14, 4, it says, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. These are the Jews in the tribulation, the first fruits. And then back to the book of James, James 5 and verse 8, Be ye also patient. Establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The coming of the Lord would be the second advent when Jesus Christ comes back to kill all the God-haters and set up his kingdom. But the verse says, Be ye also patient. This would doctrinally be to the Jews in the tribulation who will have to endure unto the end to be saved, as I've said many times if you've been listening to this James study. And it says this in Matthew 24, verse 13. And the book of Luke also says in Luke twenty one sixteen, And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. Notice that word patience. And how James 5, 8, James 5 and verse 8 says, Be also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And look at Hebrews 6.12, That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. These tribulation saints are going to need patience. What do you think these last days, books, epistles... Talk so much about patience and all the uh, denominations and cults that try to say a man can lose their salvation. They take the verses from James and Hebrews and Matthew and Revelation that are dealing with the Jews in the tribulation. They'll take verses that are supposed to be applied to them and apply it doctrinally to their self, even though they're a Christian in the church age. And they'll take those verses and say, well, we can lose our salvation because it says such and such. But you got to remember, you can't apply a lot of the things from James and Hebrews and Matthew to yourself doctrinally. And re just like it says in Revelation fourteen twelve, here is the patience of the saints here they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In the tribulation time period, to be saved, they're going to, have to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Well, you say, well, no one can keep the commandments. But, yeah, no one ever kept the commandments. But when they broke the commandment, they offered the right sacrifice and were made according to the law blameless. And it'll be like that here. Just like it says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And James 5, 9 says, Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Uh, saints in this horrible time period are going to have to stick together and not hold grudges against each other. In the church age, we aren't condemned for holding grudges even though we shouldn't. Holding a grudge in this coming time period, though it might cost you your life, they're going to have to exhort each other daily and remind each other as the verse says behold the judge standeth before the door the judge would be jesus christ who is coming back to set up his kingdom where he will be king and judge of all and matthew chapters 5 through 7 will be the millennial kingdom constitution that people will live by jesus is sitting at the right hand of the father but stands up prior to the second coming Jesus Christ will be a king and judge in the millennium. Stephen said he saw the Son of Man standing before he got stoned to death. And this is because if the Jews would have accepted his message, the second coming would have happened then. But because they rejected, there was a big postponement and the church age happened. Acts 7.56 says, And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And back to James chapter 5 and verse 10 it says, Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. 
The Jews are going to be suffering affliction at an all-time high, and they will need patience. Notice that word again. They're going to have to see examples from the prophets on how to be patient during this time of suffering. And Job is a type of the Jew in the tribulation. He will be a perfect example for these people. In James 5.11 it says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Notice that word again, endure. As it says in Matthew 24.13, He that shall endure unto the end. And James 5.11 says, Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Notice the connection here. Like I said, we count them happy which endure. And Matthew 24, 13, which is talking about how someone is saved in this future time period must endure unto the end to be saved. Then notice again the word patience. The verse says, have seen the end of the Lord. The end of the Lord for Job is when he got back everything double. Job has 42 chapters in the book, which coincides with the 42 months of the last half of the tribulation time period where the Jews will suffer this persecution. The end of the Lord for the tribulation saint is when Jesus Christ comes back and they go into the kingdom. And James 5.12 says, But above, above all things, my brethren, swear not neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Notice it says, Swear not, and mentions an oath. This is another warning James is giving to these Jews that they shouldn't take the mark and swear allegiance to the Antichrist or make an oath with him. And then James 5.13 Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. These tribulation saints are going to have to pray without ceasing and get hooked up just right to endure these afflictions during the time of Jacob's trouble. They're going to have to do it with a merry heart, but yet mourn. They're going to have to sing psalm, psalms. A psalm they will probably sing is Psalm 23. And then when they make it out of here, they will sing the Song of Moses, as it talks about in Revelation 15, 2 and 3. But James 5, 14 says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let, him, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up and if he have committed sins they shall be forgiven him in this coming time period this will work every time notice the verse says the prayer of faith shall save the sick in the church age God hears the prayer of Christians and heals people and performs many miracles all because someone prayed for someone or for themselves, but in the church age, now we anoint people with oil and pray over them, but they aren't always healed. In the time of Jacob's trouble, they will always be healed because the sign gifts come back. The sign gifts come back because it is switching back to God dealing with the Jews. The sign gifts aren't working now because God switched from Jew to Gentile, and Gentiles don't require a sign. The Bible says the Jews require a sign. And that's why speaking in tongues, faith healers, and things like that aren't for today. That's for when God is dealing with the Jews. And James 5.16 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray, for one, pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Notice it says confess, confess your faults. It doesn't say sins. What the Catholic Church does in a confessional is very unbiblical and was started out to be used for blackmail. The priest would blackmail the people who came and confessed their sins to him. And a fault isn't a sin. A fault would be like not having as big of a burden for the lost as you should or something like that. Don't confess your sins to someone else. They don't need to have their mind filled with the stuff you've got going on in your head because they already have their own stuff going on in their life. And James 5.17 says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly 
that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. It is very fitting for it to talk about Elijah, because he comes back in the tribulation as one of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, as we said before, and he will stop it from raining. These Jews in the tribulation are going to be able to make miraculous things happen with their prayers. Like I said, their effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, just as when a Christian in the church age is prayed up and confessed up, he, he has a lot of power through prayer, but not like Elijah and Moses are going to have in Revelation in the time of Jacob's trouble. And then in James 5.18 says, And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. The rain is connected with the rain before the second advent, and Elijah is said to come before that great and dreadful day of the Lord in Malachi 4 and verse 5. And John the Baptist would have been Elijah if the Jews had accepted Jesus Christ. But like I said, they rejected Jesus Christ, therefore God postponed things. And Joel 2.23 says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And then back to James 5, verses 19 and 20, it says, Brethren, if, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. When someone gets saved, then that causes a multitude of sins to never come to pass. Imagine if popular celebrities and rock stars had gotten saved at a young age and became Bible-believing Christians. Imagine if Charles Manson was saved at an early age or Hitler or Ted Bundy or any other wicked person, there would have most likely been a multitude of sins that would have never happened. If you lead someone to the Lord, then you hide a multitude of sins. If you witness to a man that is about to commit adultery, but after salvation he starts to live right and stays faithful to his wife, it would save a divorce and a broken home from ever happening. Also notice the word sinner in James two. Uh, 520 it says let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins in the church age the bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of god but if you do a study of the word sinner in the old testament you will see it as referring to a very wicked person like a harlot or a murderer and always remember to notice differences and rightly divide just like the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15. All of the Bible is for our learning, but not all of it is to us doctrinally. And that's the best way to approach the book of James. The best way to approach the Bible is to look at it through the covenants and just believe what it says. Apply the verses to you doctrinally that are for the church age and realize the verses which contradict Paul have to be for someone in a different age. Don't make the Bible contradict each other. Uh, remember not to be like a hyper-dispensationalist who only uses Romans through Philemon. There are verses in other books of the Bible that can apply doctrinally to a Christian, but the way you can know what to apply to you doctrinally is get familiar with what Paul says, and if a verse contradicts what he says about like about salvation and things like that, then you take what Paul says over what the other verse says. Just like all through the book of James, we've been seeing verses that imply that someone can lose their salvation, but yet Paul says you can't lose it. So you would take what Paul says and realize the verses that say a man can lose his salvation aren't for a Christian in the church age. But this has been James chapter 5, and we are now through with the book of James.